God knows you and your challenges and your strengths and your weaknesses far more intimately than you know them yourself. When you are in a marriage which is basically a dead end, I know the pain. It is literally dying a slow death every single day. Your soul is dying and you just don't think that there's a way out. The one piece of advice I would give to any single parent, whether it's a single mom or a single dad or anybody actually, even if you're not single, is get help. Get help if you need to. Mistakes are awesome. I still make mistakes. I make colossal mistakes, <laughs> not just small mistakes. I love making mistakes because you always learn from them, right? I feel the biggest pain when I see people who cannot find their place under the sun. Unmotivated, sad, and desperate people. Business owners, entrepreneurs, suffering from burnout, stress, and boredom, and no time for their family. My biggest goal is to help them realize that this world provides enough opportunities for everybody. I managed to help thousands of people, but I strongly believe that we can do so much more if we unite our knowledge and skills. And this is the reason I started doing interviews with the best visionaries and world changers. Their inspiring personal and success stories are a proof that everything is possible. All you have to do is listen and learn. Together, we can change our lives and the future of this world. Hello everybody, this is Warrior Family and I'm Smilian Mori. I know we are all here because we are sure we can create and live the life worth living. But in order to do this, we have to do something about it. So my purpose within this show is to bring you guests, introduce them, their belief system, habits, uh, strategies that can help you create the life worth living. And today I have a special guest. Iram Said. More than just being the host of world's leading telesummits, Iram is powerful catalyst for a change and a champion for the disempowered. Born into a culture where women were bound by strict limitations, Iram has experienced her fair share of struggle. At the age of 40, she was the survivor of two failed marriages facing bankruptcy and emotionally dissipated to the point where she considered ending it all. It was then in her darkest hour that she decided that life could be different and that she would craft the life of her dreams. Over the coming years, she worked closely with a number of energy healers and coaches that gave her the support and tools that she needed to unlock that door that stood between her and her dreams. That helped her to balance her own sacred divinity and connect with her personal power. Iram Said now lives the conscious, purpose-filled life of her dreams. But it is not enough to just live it herself. She has made it her life mission to share the teachings and support with other women around the world. Iram, Welcome to my show. Thank you. It's, it's an honor to be here, Smilian. Thank uh, you so much. Uh, when I met you in the lobby, I felt this beautiful, calm energy mm -hmm. coming from you. Thank you. What, what happened uh, <laughs> in your life? You mean uh, today or before mm -hmm. that? Before that. that yeah. you, know, you went from somebody that was divorced two times, mm -hmm. uh, bankrupt. Yes to somebody I, that is living her dream. Yeah, it was truly what you would call, uh, a lot of people have termed it as the dark night of the soul. Mm -hmm. That's basically what I was going through at that time. Mm -hmm. And it was one cycle of destruction after another. So it wasn't just you know, that the second divorce happened. I had been married 
the first time for almost eight years, the second time again for almost seven years. Each time thinking this is it, this is, you know, this is going to be my uh, marriage that's going to last, last till the end. I had one daughter each from each marriage. And uh, <clears throat> at that time, my business of 15 years, I was in financing. Uh, that was coming to an end. It was 2009, so most mm -hmm. banks in the United States weren't lending anymore. So we, um, I, that was finishing. My marriage was ending. I had four different lawsuits against me at that time. Mm -hmm. Since I didn't have any money, I didn't have any attorneys representing me, so I had to represent myself. And as you know, in, in USA, if you're going through a lawsuit and you don't have an attorney, it's, it's, it's really bad. And I had four. So it was, everything was happening at the same time. And I truly was, I hit rock bottom. Mm -hmm. And one day I did, I, I remember I was praying, it was my birthday. And you know, you must have made like a bucket list of things that you want to accomplish by the time you're a certain age. So I had a bucket list that I wanted to <laughs> accomplish by the time I was 40. And I took it out and I was so far from that, um, from my accomplishments that it was heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. And so in that moment of my darkest hour, I prayed to God and I said, you know what, either I am going to live a life that is not this hard, where it's constantly, you know, I take two steps forward and it seemed like three back, mm -hmm. um, that either I'm going to figure out how to live life in a more balanced and easier way mm -hmm. where accomplishing things is not so hard or I'm, I'm done. I'm, thank you, God, but I'm done. <laughs> I'm ready to come back. Did you consider suicide? I didn't get as far as figuring out ways, but I was at that place where I seriously didn't want to live anymore. So yes, I was, I was there. And uh, so something inside me just, just awoke that day where mm -hmm. it's like I've lost everything. There's nothing more to lose except my two beautiful daughters. I had the custody of my daughters. Mm -hmm. But I had no money. I, I knew I couldn't provide for them. So something shifted and I stopped. Somebody had sent me this link in an email to listen to a call on a telesummit. I didn't even know what they were. So I listened and, f and I finally heard this really powerful message of hope that life, nothing is happening to you. You are a co-creator. There's a reason why you are going through what you're going through. And once you understand it, you can create a different reality. You can shift. So that started my journey, journey into self-development. I started listening to telesummits. I was addicted. I used to listen to four to five hours a day. I just listened to one show after another without realizing that slowly my mindset was, was shifting. Mm -hmm. and, um, and then I remember one day I got this email where somebody was uh, offering to teach how to do telesummits. I remember I had almost hit rock bottom with my uh, finances. I didn't have any money left and that was literally my last dollar. And I invested that into How the much program. Money? It was sixty-five hundred dollars, and I had ten thousand in my bank account at that time. So that was literally <clears throat> going to wipe me out, except one month's maybe expenses. And I still remember when I talked to the coach who was selling the program. He said it's a six-month program. I said I have three months because my <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> three weeks, time. three weeks, not three months, yeah. because my daughters were coming back from summer vacation. And I didn't have more than two months finances. So I said, I have three weeks to launch um, this Damn summit. It. And he said, it's never been done. And I don't feel comfortable selling you this product. And I said, leave it to me. Just, just open it up. I, I signed a paper saying, I am not going to ask for a refund because he had a guarantee attached. And I said, I'm going to pass on that. If you open up the program, I will do this. And I launched my first summit in three weeks, three and a half weeks later. He probably didn't understand your why. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, my why was just to make money you know, and, and make, get the bills paid. <laughs> Many online coaches that I know, they, they struggle with their students because they buy the course and they don't finish the course and then yes. they don't implement anything. So I've been there, you yeah. Were <laughs> that, you were a different one. <laughs> I was desperate. Yeah. I, had, uh, I, had, uh, I did not have a safety net anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's amazing what people will do when their safety net gets taken away, you know? Some, they can give up. And you didn't. I didn't. I couldn't. 
I had my two daughters in front of me. So you had a they big reason. They were my inspiration. Yeah, mm -hmm. I had a big reason. I had taken them out of their dad's house, which was, mm -hmm. you know, very comfortable. They're, both of my ex-husbands are very well accomplished. And um, if I was going to take them out of that environment, I felt that I, I owed it to them to provide something similar. Mm -hmm. And that was my big why mm -hmm. at that time. You brought up many questions while you were talking. First, you mentioned that you learned that we all co-create something. Yes. So how did you co-create two divorces? Mm. That's the question, isn't it? I, you know, that was, it hit me hard. The first <laughs> I time I realized it. You know, I, I am one of those people that have this, this love, this devotion to truth, mm -hmm. which has um, its, uh, you know, downside. Because sometimes truth is bitter, you don't want to hear it. <laughs> but mm -hmm. when you love truth so much, you can't let it go. So Can you say it again? When, that when you love truth so much, you can't let it go. It's, it's, if it's bitter, who cares? It's the truth. And I truly believe today that truth has healing. It has the ability to heal beyond anything else. But sometimes it might hurt mm -hmm. like hell first. And that's okay. So... Um, you know, as I was going through the divorce, it was bitter. So my ex-husband and I were exchanging kind of nasty emails at that time. And in his email, in one of the emails, he had written several things, but one of the lines was, he said, have you considered that you're always the victim? You know, the first marriage happened and then divorce and, and this happened to you and that happened to you and you were a victim then and now it's happening to you again and you're a victim again. Have you considered that the one um, common denominating factor is you. Wow. That, He's a boss to, that to hit say that. me. That hit me hard <laughs> because it was the truth. I was the one common denominating factor. It's like if I was present in both situations, how can I say I had no role? Mm. Um, you know, before that, I, I had all of these excuses. I, I come from a culture, I, I was born and raised a mm -hmm. Pakistani woman. Um, Men tend to be chauvinistic from that culture and, mm -hmm. and, you know, women are supposed to be suppressed and all that. So those were my excuses and I always thought they were pretty valid until that day. And I decided to just sit down and really think about what role did I play in, mm -hmm. in this? And, and like you asked that question, I did co-create that reality. Mm -hmm. And today, if you ask me, I will say I co-created that because I, God was really wanting me to tap into my own potential. Mm -hmm. You know, if these divorces <clears throat> hadn't happened, if this, if I hadn't gone through this pain, I would never have um, opted to go so deep inside and, and bring out those gifts that I was actually mm -hmm. born with. Mm -hmm. So I think that's how I co-created these two divorces because I was meant to find me. Mm -hmm. So the pain is there for a reason. Pain is always there for a mm -hmm. reason. But we don't know and we don't realize after that we achieve something or... Right. It's, it's hindsight is twenty twenty. Mm -hmm. I have now, I can say that I have developed enough awareness mm -hmm. to actually sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes even enjoy the pain because I know what's, what's going to come right after. Sometimes it's still pretty bad and I don't enjoy it, mm -hmm. but at least I know it's there for a reason and it is always going to bring a gift, mm -hmm. always. If only we have the patience mm -hmm. and the perseverance. There mm -hmm. are always gifts hidden mm -hmm. with that pain. Mm -hmm. There's something I like to tell my uh, listeners um, and I'd love to share with you. Mm -hmm. When you're going through a challenge, if you can remember these Three things. Number one, God, if you believe in God, then it's God or universe mm -hmm. or universal energy or consciousness. I believe in God, so I like to say God. God knows you and your challenges and your strengths and your weaknesses far more intimately mm -hmm. than you know them yourself. That's number one. He's fully aware. And he's fully aware of each and every molecule in the universe, including you. So let's just say he's not an idiot. He, he knows. He's really wise. Number two, he loves you immensely. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. you are more loved by God than you love yourself or anybody else, your mother, mm -hmm. your husband, wife, children. Nobody loves you as much as God loves you. Mm -hmm. When you see these two things, then you come to the third, that if there was any situation that could have been better mm -hmm. suited to you right now than what you're going through, then rest assured, <clears throat> you would be going through that right now. God would have given that to you. So if you're going through this situation, it has to be the most perfect situation for you right now. So fall in love with it. If you fall in love with it, you will find that you give up the resistance. Mm -hmm. And when you give up the resistance, you surrender, you come into this beautiful place of, of just being neutral. And then that's where you receive the messages mm -hmm. and you receive the gifts. Mm -hmm. And literally, a lot of times you're going to find that the outside circumstances are still the same. The external circumstances are still the same. But inside, your whole world changes, you know. Mm -hmm. That's really being in peace where everything else outside seems to be chaotic. Knowing what you know now, could mm -hmm. you save both marriages? If you Ooh. wanted to. <laughs> if, you, if you wanted to. The first, no. The second, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've considered that question myself. Yeah. Do and feel, I am on very good sorry? terms with both. Hmm? Do you feel sorry that you didn't? No. 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 Because, because then I, again, became. yes. Because, again, like what I just said, what is now is perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how it was all intended to be. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. You mentioned, you know, at the beginning of each relationship I thought that is it mm -hmm. when was the first time you thought about it that is not it mm. and how long did it take you to finish the relationship from the first time that you thought about it and like you were <laughs> eight years in the marriage mm -hmm. that's it when then that's not it happened so in my first marriage I realized it the first day it was that it's not it. That, that basically that, oh my God, this is not what I thought it was going to be. That's when I... First really, day. The first day, yes. Well, you, and you have to remember, coming from the Pakistani culture, okay. me, it was still arranged marriages in those days. So mm -hmm. mine was not totally arranged. It was kind of semi-arranged. So I didn't really, hadn't dated the guy. I didn't really know him that mm. well. Mm. Yeah. So the first day, it was like a shock that, mm -hmm. uh-oh, something is seriously wrong. Hmm. And, um, but I was a young girl who was raised in a culture, in a family where divorce did not happen. I was the first one in my family to get divorced. So it just was not something that was going to happen for me. So that day I didn't know that I was going to end up divorced. It just was a shock that, oh my God, this is not what I thought it was going to be. So it took eight years to get to that point. I, I would say it took six years. And I want to tell you this, that there are a lot of people, probably in your audience even, mm -hmm. that are listening to this. And when you are in a marriage, which is basically a dead end, I know the pain. It is literally dying a slow death mm -hmm. every single day. Mm -hmm. Your soul is dying. Mm -hmm. And you just don't think that there's a way out. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you that surprisingly, what prompted me to actually take that action was the love of my daughter. Mm. She was three at that time, and I'm not going to go into the detail, but she witnessed a situation that was abusive. And I remember realizing that day, because until that point I had been saying, I'm going to stay in this marriage because I want to do it for my daughter. I want to wow. keep the marriage going. A lot of people do that. They yeah. want to stay in a marriage because of the kids. And when she witnessed the abusive situation, I, it was like I couldn't lie to myself anymore. You know, I told you about the love for truth. Couldn't lie anymore, and I realized I am raising a daughter 
who thinks it's okay for women to take abuse. Wow. Yeah. And that day, it just, I couldn't turn away from that. Like, when she grows up and she takes abuse from a man, I'm responsible because that's what I taught her. It's not what I'm going to say to her and what I, you know, what she hears in schools. It's how she is going to grow up watching her mother. And I, I just cannot be that role model. And shortly after that, I, I left. It gave me the courage to take that step. Wow, that was powerful. Yes, it still is for me. Yeah. I think we can all learn. It's not most of the time only a physical abuse, it's also psychological. Yes. And we stay in the relationship or just we think that it's going to be better. Mm -hmm. And we hope and wish. And then, like you said, first day I realized it, that is not it. And then you needed six years to, to finish something. Yeah, yeah. Six years is when I realized and, and it still took eight years. Yeah. To finally another actually two years. leave. Yeah, another two years to finally say, I, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I have to tell you, you know, my experiences um, with failed marriages actually did the opposite to me. Instead mm -hmm. of losing hope in love, I made it my business to learn more about love. Like, how come everybody else seems to be getting it right? There's so many people mm -hmm. that actually are happy in relationships. So which part of it is, am I not getting? Mm -hmm. So I have worked with coaches. I have, I hired some of the world's best relationship coaches. Like, like help me, what am I doing wrong? Even if I'm co-creating mm -hmm. this, how can I change that? And um, I'm happy to tell you that I actually even now coach on how to have happy relationships <laughs> and I have helped to save several marriages where that were almost at the brink of divorce so it's a it's a complete turnaround what, what is the one of the main re, one of the main reason reasons uh, of divorce my experience your is experience, mostly yeah, yeah my experience story. is mostly with the Pakistani culture okay so I would say the main, and, and maybe it's true for every culture really, is uh, misunderstanding and miscommunication. When mm -hmm. people don't know. Yeah, I think it's common in every it's, it, Really, and, and that's what it is. It's, it's, they're not able to communicate what they're feeling. Mm -hmm. So what they end up doing is they start creating judgments in their head, mm -hmm. and then they do projections, and they, well, he's doing this because, mm -hmm. well, how do you know? You know, that's mm -hmm. one of the things mm -hmm. when I talk to these people, I'm like, how do you know what he's thinking? And how do you know what she's thinking? Mm -hmm. Did you ask her? Did you talk to her? No, but this is like, no, you don't know. It's amazing how many people are convinced they know what their spouse is thinking, mm -hmm. and it's all negative. <laughs> mm -hmm. And when you, when you actually sit down and have very clear and vulnerable communication, it's very different mm -hmm. and it's so remarkable that if you dig long enough, you're going to find one thing and that's love. That's why they got mm -hmm. together. That's why they're still trying to mm -hmm. make it work and they're going to give themselves all kinds of reasons and the love is actually still there mm -hmm. and they have no idea. Your daughters are 20 years old and 12. Yes. So you were a single mother. Yes. Uh, did you do any mistake? Did what? I what? Did you do any mistakes? In like raising them? In raising them? Oh my God, several. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, made lots of mistakes and learned. Mm -hmm. um, I think, you know, we are, um, as parents, we are all going to mess up our kids. We're all going to do that. It's just, you know, let's just accept that first. <laughs> let's get that on the yeah. table. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then we have this guilt of being, oh, God, I'm not a, I lived through that. I'm not a good mother. I'm a terrible mm -hmm. mother. I don't give enough time to my daughters because, you know, after 2012, my career just took off. And, you know, the business that I started mm -hmm. that yeah. I told you about that was started from scratch, hit seven figures very quickly. And since then, it's just been growing and growing and growing. And um, I have to travel a lot. So I had a lot of guilt and then I started to see other people's children and I realized you know my daughters really love hanging out with me and they actually love spending time with me and we do a lot of goofy stuff together you know and uh, 
and I would talk to them and you know lately I, I asked my both of my daughters like you know I'm traveling a lot again and I think I I think I need to spend more time with you guys. And they both were like, oh, please. No. Please, no. <laughs> no, no, enough. <laughs> no more, mom. I'm like, really? I thought I should spend more time. And they're like, no, we're good. We're good. So I, I got the same answer from uh, <laughs> Dr. Marshall Goldsmith, number yeah. one coach in the world. Yeah. yeah. He was striking uh, how much time he spent with uh, his, uh, his kids. and when they I love his advice that it should be tracked. tracked yeah. I'm going to track yeah, it yeah. too now. Yeah. I wasn't tracking it. <laughs> yeah. but so at, when he, they were 15, they told, no, no more tracking. It's yeah. enough. <laughs> it's enough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So. so is it possible for a single mother to raise kids and have a successful business? Yes, absolutely it is possible. The one piece of advice I would give to any single parent, yeah. whether it's a single mom or a single dad or anybody actually, even if you're not single, is get help. Get help if you need to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I am a big fan of personality tests. So mm -hmm. I'm, I'm always, if there's a good personality test out there, I'm going to take it because I love discovering more and more mm -hmm. about myself and really understanding mm -hmm who I am, what makes me tick, what makes me go, and where are the, what are the areas that I'm really not gifted in, mm -hmm. where I'm challenged. And any test I take, it's so funny, it's, it's really lopsided. You know, that um, the DISC test, mm -hmm. I took that recently in, a, in an NLP class, and the lady, she said, in my 30 years, there are very few results that I have seen, like the one that I see with you. She's like, I'm sorry to tell you, but it's usually like sociopaths and serial killers have this kind of, <laughs> of a personality <laughs> test because it's so <laughs> lopsided, right? It's like, that um, was really funny. And, and I know that in my life because... I, the more I have, I have gotten away from actually being a housewife and mm -hmm. I've been able to really just develop my skills in business, I am um, um, in, in the wealth dynamics test, which you call a creator mechanic. Mm -hmm. I love creating new um, businesses, ideas. You put me somewhere where I've got to do some creative thinking, brainstorming, and I can do that all, all day long. But when it comes to organizing and those kinds of things, I'm lost, like seriously lost. And so I realized that early on that, you know, there's a popular notion in some um, coaching uh, mechanisms that you find out where you're not strong and you try mm -hmm. to create a balance and you work on your weaknesses. Uh, no, don't do that. Don't <laughs> That's do a waste. That. Yeah, <laughs> waste of time. God made you in a certain way because yeah. of a reason. Right? So you focus on your strengths. That's where your genius is. Go deeper into yeah. that. Develop more of that. Let go of what you are weak in and, and delegate. If you mm -hmm. can afford to, hire help. Mm -hmm. And hire the people that are actually good in that particular area. So I, when I, whenever I'm hiring, I make people take these tests. And then I know okay, they are actually suited for this job. Mm -hmm. If I'm hiring someone to organize stuff and they're not really um, skilled in that, I'm not going to put them in that job because they're not going to be happy. That's mm -hmm. not their natural skill. So which, I have that. Which test do you use? I usually use the wealth dynamics. Wealth I, dynamics. I really like that. What yeah. is the name of the guy that... Uh, George Hamilton? Yes, yes. Yeah. I met him at the A-Fest. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah I A really love that test. It's, it's, it's very, for business, it's yeah, very, yeah. yeah, very accurate for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you started a business. The kids were probably 10 and 5, 6 years old. Mm -hmm. Approximately, yeah. Approximately. Yeah. How did you get the idea to start Telesummit business? You know, it, I wish I could say that I, it was a really smart business idea or that I did some market research or anything like that. I didn't. didn't. I didn't. It's just that I loved listening to telesummits. Mm -hmm. I loved what they were doing for people like myself that felt lost and confused. And, when, and, and I remember when I used to listen to those interviews, I always used to think, you know, if I was doing this interview, I would have asked this, this, yes, and this yeah. question. And maybe you did that naturally yeah, as yeah, well, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, and I, I, had, I didn't know it at that time, but interviewing was a natural skill for mm -hmm, me. Mm -hmm. 
So when I saw that email where somebody's saying, hey, do you ever think what you would be like if you were um, the host of an interview? And I'm like, yeah, this would be great. Um, so by that time, I had learned that when you get a really big yes here, like yeah, in your yeah. gut, that's a sign from the divine. And I had learned that, you know, it's not going to be that one day, you know, you're going to get this epiphany. And some people do, but most people don't. It's, you're not going to find out suddenly what your purpose is. Yeah. Purpose is something that evolves over mm -hmm. time. And the way you align with that purpose is by saying yes to your passions. What lights you up? Mm -hmm. What gets you excited? So this got me very excited when I got that email. And I said, yeah, I, I want to learn how to do telesummits. And like I said, I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a safety net. Put my bottom dollar mm -hmm. in there and, and um, three and a half weeks later, I did my first summit. Wow. No tech knowledge. No. And that's the other thing. When you're divinely guided and you're taking action in, the, in, that, in that direction, um, the right people, the right tools and the right resources mm -hmm. are provided. And um, so this is really funny that the gentleman who was teaching that course, yeah. um, he was the biggest name in the industry at that time. Who is this guy? Oh, I... You don't... You don't. I don't... Yeah, I would rather not name him. <laughs> I adore what he did for me, okay. but that, yeah, that may not be such a good idea. Because wait till the, uh, you, once you hear the whole story, you'll know why. So <clears throat> he was offering um, his own tech team, uh, you know, for like, for beginners. Uh, do it. That, do yeah, it that, that we had to pay for it. Um, that if you can afford to pay for this team, because they already know how to set these things up, they will help you with some of the templates in the beginning um, on a you know, kind of limited basis. Um, the lady who was uh, running that, her name is Nyla, she was out of India and um, she did not like beginners. So when I reached out, she said, I have reached my maximum cap capacity. I can't really take on more clients. And I begged and I pleaded and and she wouldn't agree. And then finally I said, you know, I am this Pakistani woman from, you know, <laughs> I'm a single mom and I have two daughters. So I used that card. <laughs> and she's like, fine, okay. And she felt bad for me. And she said, yes. Then I told her, I don't have any money to pay you. So can you please wait to collect payment until my summit is completed? So I will pay you from the revenues. She agreed. <laughs> She had already said yes. She already felt bad for me. So she said yes. And when my summit launched, it was a three week long summit. I, I don't remember the exact amount, but I think it was close to $4,000 in mm -hmm. positive uh, revenue. Her bill was $3,500. And I paid that first and I had only 500. And she told me, she's like, I feel so bad. You don't have any money left. And I'm like, I am ecstatic. This is my first venture and I'm positive cash flow by $500. Are you kidding me? And she's been with me ever since. Oh, she wow. is my right hand person. Yeah. Assistant, she, no. Not even assistant. You can say almost like a COO. Wow. She has, she's, she's been right by my side and we took that business and grew it to the seven figures together. And um, she works exclusively for me. That's why I wasn't giving you that gentleman's name because okay, he didn't that. really like <laughs> <laughs> and, and I was his biggest competition eventually. So sometimes that's how the universe works. But I, I've been very blessed that um, I was given the right people from the very beginning. Did you ask her ever mm -hmm. why, why she chose you? Well, in the beginning, she just felt bad for me. Yeah. So but this is not a good enough reason well, to stay with somebody. To stay with me, you know, that's a good question. I should um, ask her again. But we have become good friends mm -hmm. and we have been through a lot together. And she trusts me and she loves my vision. Mm -hmm. So that at the end of the day, and I can say that for um, all of the people that work in my company now that they love the vision, they're committed to the vision. So that's, that's a very, very important mm -hmm. thing. 
How many people you have in the company? Um, <clears throat> people that work directly with me are 10, and then there are more that work wow. with them. Yeah. So what positions do they fill in? We have um, Nyla, who pretty much does everything. I call her the CEO, but she does everything yeah. else mm -hmm. that I don't do. I do mostly the, the, I create the vision, I do the creative work, and I do the interviews. Um, and whenever there's a new company that, it, you know, a new idea that we need to launch, that's typically uh, my job. Uh, then we have a social media manager who is also kind of a business development mm -hmm. person. Um, another, you know, she's been with me now, um, I think more than five years, Gretchen. She's amazing. And um, then we have someone who handles bookings and stuff. Uh, the only family member I have working with me. And uh, she does that. So these are the three main people. And then um, I believe you know some of the people that um, work with me for business development. These are kind of outsourced. Okay. Um, Dan Cushell, who's, uh -huh. who's uh -huh. absolutely uh -huh. amazing. And, um, and then we have full-time copywriter uh, uh -huh. team. So I deal just with the main copywriter, and then he's got people working yeah. for him. And then um, we have a few more people that do kind of like VA work, mm -hmm. so that have been mm -hmm. uh, with the company um, almost two years now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So pretty much everybody that works with me has been with us mm -hmm. two, three, four, five years. So what is your vision? You said they, they like my vision. Yeah. My personal vision for my life, the why, my why is um, I want to be uh, a very successful self-made businesswoman, mm -hmm. Pakistani, most successful self-made Pakistani businesswoman. Mm -hmm. The why is that, you know, when I was, um, that first divorce that I was talking about, when I was considering you know, being on my own. I had never been on my own. And you have to also realize, you know, I was educated in Pakistan. I have a bachelor's degree from a college in Pakistan, but here it's like high school degree. It's not considered anything. So I thought I was useless. I, I could not, you know, survive in, in, in a society on my own. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day I was watching um, the interview of Madeleine Albright. And she talked about how when she was married, how she felt almost exactly the same way. And it wasn't until she got divorced that she discovered. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, Secretary of State. I mean, wow. You know, that was huge for me. And then I heard Martha Stewart, who had a kind of a similar story going on. Those women, just by sharing their story and for being who they were, mm -hmm. gave me the permission to hope it was so important. And I, and, and I realized today that Muslim women, you know, in, 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 culturally right now, there's so many women um, that are oppressed and they can't get out of bad marriages or whatever the situation is. And they feel, um, because this is kind of ingrained into them as they're growing up culturally, that you cannot survive without a man, that you can't be successful without a man. Or if you do survive without a man, it's going to be kind of a hand-to-mouth kind of a living. And you're always going to be dependent on the ex-husband or somebody else. And <clears throat> I wanted to prove that that doesn't have to be the case, wow. right? So by me being who I am, it's like the invitation to so many other women to say, you know what? It's possible. We can do this. Mm. So that's my big why. And so I have the vision that is connected to that, to really um, have these um, different facilities. So I do business coaching. I do entrepreneurship coaching. And um, I help f um, fund a school in Pakistan that mm. was started by my mom. But it helps children get educated that are, you know, um, mm. Um, garbage collectors. We take them off of the street and put them in schools. So that's basically all connected to the vision that this is what we want to mm -hmm. be doing. But really creating that space for women, especially Muslim women, mm -hmm. 
to It's not so common empowered. for Muslim, Muslim women that start a business. No. No? Typically, it's not. But, but the thing is, a lot of uh, you know, non-Muslims and Muslims alike have the misconception that it has to do with the religion, but it mm -hmm. doesn't. Because one of the things I'm passionate about is teaching people the reality of Islam, the, the real Islam. And the truth is, um, I'm, I'm writing my book, it's called Khadija's Path. Uh -huh. And Khadija is the name of Prophet Muhammad's first wife, who was a very successful entrepreneur. When she married him, she actually, he worked for her. And um, she was the successful, she was like um, wow. one of the tribal leaders. Very strong, powerful woman. She proposed to him because of his ethical character. And, um, and she was a very strong, wise woman. So it's, it's kind of like counterintuitive when you look at the Islamic culture now, and a lot of women feel that it's not even right for a woman to be independent of her mm -hmm. husband. And I really, truly believe that it is imperative for Muslim women to understand mm -hmm. that they have to be financially independent of their husbands mm -hmm. if they want to have happy marriages. It is possible to have that. That is a strong statement. Yes, it is. I, and I realize it. I realize it. So. Are you willing to carry yes. the load? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. I am. So, you, your new business venture is the healing platform. Yes. Can, can you talk about it? Sure. So, <laughs> one of the things I realized as I, um, you know, my main business is From Heartache to Joy, which is the yeah. Telesummit that I was mentioning, and I interview healers, we talk, and, and we talk about their services, and then we offer their services, and people, if they feel inclined, they invest in that. But one of the things I realized, there was this vacuum that some people, when they are going through a hardship, or they're going through mm -hmm. a challenge, they want to get healing now, mm -hmm. or they want to talk to a coach now, in real time, and that was missing. There's no platform no. on the internet where you can go and, and do that with, you know, with high quality healers or coaches. I mean, I'm not talking about the psychic networks and okay, all that yeah. stuff. So, so we basically have filled that vacuum by launching Manifestality. That's my new website and it's uh, the largest platform of energy healers and coaches that are available 24-7 for mm. on-demand sessions. So, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting. Something new. Yes, yes it is. So can ma manifestality.com. Yes, manifestality. Mm -hmm. And the, and the Summit one is uh, hard to... From heartache heart to from joy. From heartache to joy. Dot. Dot com. So. Yeah, so you could, it, it's free to listen to those calls and they're awesome mm -hmm. because we do a lot of free energy healing mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. So you, you, what advice would you give to some women that want to start a business and they're afraid that they can fail? Well, the fear of failure is, is always going to be there, and I even say it's healthy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, courage is not when you have lack of fear. Courage is when you feel the fear and you do it anyway, mm -hmm. and it's exciting. So I think a lot of women, people, entrepreneurs, everybody, we stop before we even begin because we are afraid to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So number one, mistakes are awesome. I still make mistakes. I make colossal mistakes, <laughs> not just small mistakes. I love making mistakes because you always learn from them, right? It's not about the mistake. It's what you do after that. Mm -hmm. That's important. So women that want to start a business, first of all, uh, I get this question asked all the time. Uh, what should I do? Well, what do you love doing? Mm -hmm. Martha Stewart did what she loved doing, and it happened to be the only skill she had at that time. Mm -hmm. But she loved baking and stuff, and that's what she did. You know, um, Madeleine Albright was kind of, she didn't even know it, but she was really good socialite, and mm -hmm. she knew how to play that power play game. It was a natural talent for her. And a lot of us don't realize our strengths because they come so naturally mm -hmm. to us that we kind of downplay them. So. One of the things I tell women to do is ask your friends, ask mm -hmm. other people that love you to tell you, what am I really good at? Mm -hmm. It could be that you're actually really good at listening. Mm -hmm. And that's a skill that can be packaged, that can be marketed. There are people that will pay you to listen to them and give them advice. I mean, 
whatever you have as your natural talent, it's a gift mm -hmm. that somebody out there is looking for. So get educated on how to, how to package and present and promote and all of those things. Do you have any productivity hacks or advice how you manage your time in the business outside? So I am going to maybe surprise you, maybe not surprise okay. you, I don't know, <laughs> by saying I'm one of those people that are, that are crazy when it comes to creating stuff. Uh, my team, the hardest job they have is to manage me. You. Yeah. <laughs> to manage you. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I'm your typical creative entrepreneur that just that... I know somebody like that probably. <laughs> Yes, so I wish I could sit here and appear all wise and tell you that yes, yeah, I'm like that. Yeah. No, yeah. I'm I'm I am best when it's chaos, and you know my team knows it. When I'm in that mode, I can't stop. My mm -hmm. brain won't stop working, and I just it's just mm -hmm. creating. And I now they know to let the flow happen. Um, you know, mm -hmm. ever since I've come back from, I just recently went to the pilgrimage in Mecca mm -hmm. and I just came back and I just had so many downloads and it's been just, you know, constant. Mm -hmm. I've been sending voice memos to everybody in the middle of the night, even mm -hmm. poor Dan gets an earful also in emails and it's like voice memos, like I just got this. And so my advice is if you are like this, then, and you know, if you're like this, don't stop that flow. Mm -hmm. When it's happening, it's, it's really, you're connected. Mm -hmm. So let that come through mm -hmm. and, and record it somewhere, either voice memos or, or mm -hmm. written or something. And when you go back, you look at it and you would just go, how did I even think of this? Mm -hmm. how, this is amazing. It is amazing because it's coming from the higher source at that time. So... Yeah, that's hopefully that helps. That's great productivity. Hey? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Being the flow. And yeah, play. and then sometimes you're just sitting yeah. there for months yeah. going, oh God, I'm so bored. What's going on? <laughs> it's not happening. But, you know, it's, you can't control it. When yeah. you're on, you're on. And when it's not on, you can't turn it on, you know. Your girls are interested in what you do or? One of them is. One. Uh, the other one is uh, the opposite. I don't think she's going to be an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. Um, she is very, very logical. She's very articulate. She will make a great attorney if that's what she wants to become. Mm -hmm. Probably animal rights attorney is mm -hmm. what she would like to be. My older daughter, though, is a lot like me and, and mm -hmm. way better than me. Mm -hmm. I can already see that, you know, mm -hmm. at such a young age, she mm -hmm. is way better at it mm -hmm. than I am. So. What values would you like to pass down to your kids? daughter? Ah. <clears throat> I think the most important value that I would like my daughters to always be committed to is self-growth. Mm -hmm. That no matter what happens, you know, if you are in business, in relationship, whatever it is, your goal, your ultimate goal needs to be as long as I am moving forward in growth, then it's okay, then I'm okay. Because growth leads to not only connection with self, but connection to the divine. Mm -hmm. and, and also to know that a life, first of all, a life unexamined is not worth living, mm -hmm. honestly. And a life that, is not, that does not contain a big part that is connected to service, to giving back to fellow humans, is also not worth living. So these two elements mm -hmm. really have to be present. And when they are present, then whatever challenges you go through, you will be fine. In your heart, you will have peace. Mm -hmm. You know, as a parent, we want to protect our children. We, we want to teach them so they never have to face challenges in their lives. And that's not going to happen. That's not realistic. And it's also not beautiful. You know, there's mm -hmm. this beauty about challenges because that brings out a person's real self. And... So long ago, I realized my daughters are going to go through their own challenges. And they actually have, mm -hmm. you know, witnessing divorces and stuff like that. But that's their destiny. And that's, you know, what they co-created. But with these kinds of principles in place, hopefully they are going to understand that challenges are a gift mm -hmm. from God. 
you work with many coaches and healers. I do. Uh, uh, is there some special healer or technique that you would recommend to heal wounds from childhood? Mm. Good question. Um, wounds from childhood. Well, those are the ones we're healing all our life, aren't, aren't we? <laughs> they last us a lifetime mm -hmm. and they come up in layers. Mm -hmm. You know, you think you're done and then you're like, oh my God. It's here again. <laughs> it's here again. <laughs> so energy healing is great for inner child healing and there, there are lots of great mm -hmm. programs for that. Mm -hmm. You know, in all honesty, the ones that I really love for, for any kind of healing is not an energy healing tool. Mm -hmm. It's the work of Byron Katie. I don't mm. know if you're familiar with that. Yes. I love her work because it really helps you to not believe this anymore. Is this true? Right? And it's like, oh my God, your percept. It's like you can look at a situation which looks so bleak and when you learn to do the work on it, it, it flips. And now you can, you can choose whichever reality you want to believe. And Who's to say which one is... Go a little bit deeper because maybe, you know, people that watch, they, they don't read. Byron Katie? Yeah. So, do you want me to explain yeah. the process? Yeah. So, uh, very briefly, what it does is it, it, there's, there's a few questions. So, you would start with, if I were to say, um, let's say, using my example from earlier, my husband hurt me. Let's say that's the, yeah. the, the statement I'm working on. He hurt me. So I will take that statement and I would first put the question, is this true? Well, yes, it's true. He hurt me. Okay, can I be 100% sure that this is true? Now you begin to kind of settle like, well, one can never be sure 100%. And so your brain is now already kind of breaking the story apart. <laughs> yeah, it's processing it. It's like, I don't know if I'm 100% sure. Okay. And then you go, I'm, I'm just going to give you the brief yeah. version. And it's like, how does it make me feel when I think this thought? So you mm -hmm. think, well, I'm angry and I want to do this. And I want to think it's, not un it's unfair and I feel victimized. And so you're putting all those thoughts, you know, you're acknowledging how you feel. Mm -hmm. And then you say, how, um, what is the evidence? Mm -hmm. So you ask, what is the evidence that this is true? Because when you give your brain a task, it's going to complete it. So it's going to come up with lots of evidence. Yeah, he hurt me because yeah. he said this, then he did that, and then, so you have the evidence. And then you do the turnaround, and mm -hmm. that's where the magic yes. happens, right? So he hurt me, and you turn that around, and it could be, he did not hurt me. And then you say, what, what is the evidence for that? Again, your brain is now assigned a task. Mm -hmm. It's going to go find mm -hmm. the, the proof. And you will, it'll be surprising. First, you'll come up with one. And then Katie likes to say, if you can come up with one, you can come up with more. So you come up with more and you're like, hmm, so he did not hurt me. And then another turnaround is, I hurt me, right? Then you say, what's the evidence of that? And then your brain mm -hmm. will give you evidence of that. And then another turnaround could be, I hurt, hurt him. him. Wow, that and is powerful. Yeah. And then it's like, what's the evidence of that? and you will find evidence. And so it, it's so awesome because it really mm -hmm. teaches you that whatever our brain is telling us is not necessarily true, it's a story. And once mm -hmm. you become good, once you become experienced at you know, taking these stories apart, dismantling these stories, life becomes amazing. You know, because you get to choose what you wanna believe in. If, mm -hmm. if something, does not make you feel good when you believe that, why choose that thought? Choose the opposite that makes you feel better. I'm so happy that you brought this up because similar process I mm -hmm. do every day since... Sorry. Since March probably. Every day. Mm -hmm. Every day I find something that is annoying me, something that I'm upset yeah. with, something. I all, every day I find. Mm -hmm. Today. I have another three hours to find something that, <laughs> that, that triggered me. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, because we have these triggers that... So these triggers, yeah. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. These triggers, I used to have so many of them in mm -hmm, a day. Mm -hmm. 
And that's when I was in a negative state. You know, you mentioned I work with coaches. Even when I didn't have too much money, that's something I kept yeah. investing in. And I hired a coach at that time, and, and it was the beginning of my journey. And so he gave me this task, and he said, um, your job, until we talk next week, is to find how many negative thoughts you have in a day. Mm -hmm. First, he asked me, how many thoughts do you have in a day that are negative? And I thought, probably 20. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he said, okay, well, please write them down. Keep your journal with you and write them down. So I had 20 negative thoughts in the first, like, 30 minutes, probably. And, and then it became harder because he said, for every negative thought, you have to think two to three positive thoughts to, you know, kind of um, so neutralize it. <laughs> yeah, to neutralize it. So I started to do that, and within, like, half a day, this is how smart our brain is. It's plastic and it's always evolving. The moment I would start thinking a negative thought, I would say, uh, 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 it's too much hard work to think positive <laughs> thoughts, so I'm going to stop right here. <laughs> but that's when I realized, oh my God, my day is filled with negative thoughts. And those are our triggers. So that, that practice that you have is fabulous mm -hmm. because guess what? A year from now, you're going to realize you hardly have any triggers left. Yeah. So that energy you mentioned when you met me in the lobby. Yeah, that's because. Mm -hmm. It's like you're, you, you go through bad traffic yeah. and it's, I'm running late or whatever. And it's just like, <sighs> calm, you know. It's Everything beautiful. happens for a reason. It does. Yeah, it does. What is the purpose of life for you? Oh, my goodness. Purpose of life for me. It's evolving. Mm. It's, it's evolving and it's unfolding. But I mentioned a couple of things already. Like I said, it's, it's, it's different passions right now for me. Mm -hmm. And I have learned that, and that's, by the way, um, the work of um, uh, Janet Atwood and Chris Atwood, mm -hmm. the passion test. Um, I signed up with Chris Atwood, um, I believe, four years ago. So he's mm -hmm. my mentor and coach. And I just, I can't tell you how much value that has brought into my life. But mm -hmm. What he taught me is that when you pay attention to what excites you, what lights you up, what brings joy into your life, and you follow those passions, your, your dharma or your purpose is mm -hmm. going to evolve naturally. It's going to start mm -hmm. unfolding and it's going to show. And I really don't know, because I know there's a lot of people that ask, like, you know, I want to know what my purpose is. And I really don't know if there's a way for you to just one day find what your purpose is and if it's going to stay the same for mm -hmm. 10 years, mm -hmm. 20 years. And, and I, maybe some people have it that way. For me, it, it's evolving. And I love that process because it's, it's exciting. Otherwise, I would get bored, you know, mm -hmm. the way my nature is. <laughs> I would be bored if I, if I knew that this is what it is going to be for the rest of my life. So I stay excited and intrigued. Um, I'm passionate about helping um, women. Mm -hmm. I'm passionate about helping Muslim women become financially mm -hmm. independent. I'm passionate about talking about the real Islam, not just to non-Muslims, but Muslims also, because mm -hmm. there are a lot of people that don't know what the real beauty of Islam was. Mm -hmm. um, I'm passionate about teaching, you know, that long-term happy relationships are a possibility mm -hmm. and what are the tools that are required um, to accomplish that. Um, so, yeah, these are some of my passions that mm -hmm. I, I pursue. Mm -hmm. well, what is the definition of success? Ooh, I think success is when, when, you've, when you have peace, mm -hmm. when you have contentment, you know. I, I have been there where I didn't have anything and I was unhappy. And I have also been where I had everything that you think that you want to have in the external mm -hmm. circumstances, and I wasn't happy. And it wasn't until I realized that there is a part of us that always yearns for a very deep connection with the divine, a very meaningful, deep, consistent connection with the divine. And at least that's what it was for me. And when I have been able to achieve that, and that does take, mm -hmm. you know, uh, regular work, um, you constantly work at it. For me, that's real success. That, you know, you can, um, 
you can have peace no matter what your circumstances. I, I mentioned to you I was at the pilgrimage. Just I came back 10 days ago. It's the Hajj. Um, every Muslim is supposed to mm -hmm. perform Hajj at least once in their lifetime. I was very scared. I didn't want to go for, you know, I, all these years I said, no, I don't want to go. <laughs> it's physically very, very tough. And you're talking about two to three million people cramped together in a, in, a, in a town, in a city, and they're doing the same rituals, all of them at the same time, um, public restrooms. And for how long? It's, it can be, some people do 40 days, some people do, I did two weeks, but it's, the actual Hajj is five days. And it's 107 degrees weather, typically, scorching heat, and um, very, very, you're walking a lot, so it's, it's physically taxing. Um, you're out of your comfort zone, you're, you're, you're spending time under, you know, in tents. They're air-conditioned, but it's still a tent. Um, you're not at home, you're not, you know, whatever comforts you're used to, you, you say goodbye to those, and you're kind of like one with millions of people, you look the same, you dress the same, and you pretty much all are like paupers. And um, so I was scared of doing that. It's mm -hmm. like, I don't know if I can go through that. Um, you know, I like to spoil myself. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things I've learned. Like, this is however I want others to treat me, I treat myself first. <laughs> so, so I'm very used to having a certain lifestyle. And over there, I was walking miles in the heat. Um, you can't wear deodorant. At those three days, you can't bathe, you can't wear deodorant, so you can imagine. And it's like... <laughs> unimaginable and uh, you are one of the nights I realized after having walked and having been in the heat when we came to the place where we were supposed to sleep we were in a big group I realized it was gonna be um, under the open sky on on the pavement so on on dirt and gravel and I mean there were pebbles sticking into my mm -hmm. back no mattress you just have this thin sheet you put it on the ground and you're supposed to sleep there and uh, with, with bus horns blaring in my ears, diesel fume in my face. I did not think I was like, there's no way I can sleep. And would you believe it? I was the first person to go to sleep. As soon as, as soon as I put my head back on my backpack, I was fast asleep and I slept the night, which was almost six and a half hours. Other people were envying me. And I really think they thought, She's lying back reason. home in America. She's probably a homeless person. That's why she's so comfortable <laughs> on the pavement. <laughs> I tell you, when I woke up, I felt this, this surge of euphoria and true liberation. True liberation. Because this was, I did not even know, like, who am I? I don't even know who I am anymore. But I am this, this, this person inside with no name. The personality was gone, you know, after this, the, the constant beating up physically and emotionally. The personality was gone. And I was just this, this soul experiencing huma humanity at this amazingly basic level. When I'm hungry, I'm provided food. When I'm thirsty, I'm provided water. And when I need to go to use the restroom, yes, it's a public restroom. It's very, very dirty, but who cares? I, I'm, I'm able to use it. The basic needs are always met. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized this is true freedom. I am not a slave to my personality's limitations right now. I overcame all of the things I didn't think I was ever going to be able to overcome. That was mm -hmm. success for me. Mm -hmm. In that moment, I felt the most successful person in the world. Dirty, stinky, <laughs> on the pavement. I was euphoric. Did you share with your daughters? Yes. Yes. What did they say? They said, oh, just don't ask us to go. <laughs> yeah, you, you're going to go. <laughs> I hope, Mom, you don't expect me to go. They won't get it. They're too young mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. But one day they will. Can you share some painful experience from your childhood that made you who you are today? I, I was thinking about that question. Um, and one thing that has been kind of a repeat pattern in my childhood was always standing up for the rights of women. Mm. You know, I was raised in a, in a military family. My dad was a general. Uh, my uncles were also in the military, also generals. So it was, a, it was a really hardcore military family. 
And um, I was the only daughter, so I was really spoiled. And um, but the one, th but but it was a Pakistani family, so the the culture was very much very strong, very conservative. Women weren't supposed to do certain things. And um, it's a funny story, you know. One day I was sleeping, and and you know, we, in, in our culture we have families together. We do a lot of stuff together. So my cousins were there. And the girls had all gone out to take a walk in the park. And I was, I, they didn't bother waking me up, so I was sleeping. And I woke up, there was this huge chaos going on in the house. Mm -hmm. My mom was there, my uncles, my aunts, everybody was there. And, and um, <clears throat> one of my cousins, he was the oldest guy, he was making a lot of, um, a big scene about the fact that he said, you know, imagine I was with my friends, with my guy friends, and I get, we get a call um, saying, hey, guys, come on, come on. There's some really pretty girls walking in the park. Let's go and follow them and let's go and, you know, that's kind of, that's in, this was back in the 80s. That was mm -hmm. the extent of uh, interaction between girls and boys um, in my culture at that time. So he so said, imagine when we were following those girls and, you know, making cat calls and stuff. And I suddenly realized, oh, these are my sisters. <laughs> And so he went to them, he's like, come back home right now. And, and, you know, so now they were in trouble. The girls were in trouble because they had gone for a walk and these guys had, had made cat calls. And, and I remember I was half asleep still and I started, like, I started calling him out. I'm like, you should be ashamed because you're saying it would have been okay if they were somebody else's sisters. But because they were your sisters, it's a problem. So why do we, the girls, because they said, okay, nobody can go to the park anymore. None of the girls can go walk. And I said, why is it that we have to pay the price for your transgressions? It's your problem. Why are you going and catcalling behind girls? And, and, and boom, there was a huge like sound, and that was my mom slapping me. She slapped me and said, Look at you. This is what she was always worried that I was too headstrong, and this is not something a nice Pakistani girl would say. And I kept fighting, and she's like, "You should be ashamed," because she thought I was one of those girls. And and then they eventually said, "No, she wasn't even with them." And everybody was surprised. Like, why would you get into so much trouble when you weren't even with them? And that's what I do even today, because, you know, I feel so strongly that Muslim women are made to pay the price. Of, of the transgressions of men. It's almost like, why do we have to be covered up so much when, you know, what they say is it's because you want to curb the desires of a man. Well, why are we responsible for the desires of a man? He should be able to curb it himself. So that's one of my passions too, that I keep talking about um, the unfairness of, of the culture where women are made to stay at home or they can't mingle or they can't go out where the where it's not safe sometimes because um, of the men not taking responsibility mm -hmm. for their own actions mm -hmm. so that really shaped my trajectory in life that could be another show <laughs> yes i would love that yeah and there is a show on that by the way is it <laughs> yes wow that was powerful i have a last question Okay, I call but I'm it, having so much fun, yeah. yeah. I call it, but we have to end. <laughs> uh, I call it power message or last message. Mm. Just pretend that you only have five seconds to live. What message would you send to your kids, to your two daughters, that would stay with them till the rest of their life? Life is beautiful. Life is beautiful. Never stop believing that. Wow. Yeah. Life is beautiful. Yeah. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. It was it an was, honor. Yeah, it's it was so much nice fun. To have yes. You on the show. So remember, life is beautiful. Never forget that. And watch another show. Smilan Mori Warrior Family. See you next time.